And so um, Rachel just put all the information in the chat there. This was really wonderful, magnificent to have um, a former choir member of us, um, Crystal Williams, sing today. So we are transitioning right now to the African-American reading. Um, Eleanor has asked for specifically for this cue. Um, I won't put a whole into a long introduction to this, um, just the invitation to stay. And Eleanor um, has prepared the introduction. Um, Eleanor, can, can you um, start talking so that we can bring you to the foreground? Uh, yes. There she is. Thank you. Good morning, Eleanor. Thank you so much for leading us here in this effort. Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, Walden and the singer for Lift Every Voice and Sing. I knew that I would say we start the reading every year with Lift Every Voice and Sing, but I never imagined that all of this had been planned. What a beautiful start. Um, Okay, so we are ready to start. The African American Reading, established 31 years ago by the Black Caucus of the National Council of the Teachers of English for the celebration of African American history and culture, did not just happen. Something from the past inspired it. In 1926, one week in February was designated Negro History Week by a man named Carter G. Woodson, a Negro historian who earned his PhD from Harvard in 1912. Dr. Woodson was the son of a slave. Why did he choose February? The birthday of Frederick Douglass, slave turned free man and abolitionist was February 14th. And President Abraham Lincoln's birthday was February 12th. Negro History Week began as an observance in Negro schools. National change came about 50 years later. In 1976, the commemoration was lengthened to the entire month of February and was named Black History Month. It continues to be celebrated in schools and churches by many communities and artistic groups across the country. We at Trinity are part therefore of an, an historic national observance, this being our 18th year. This year, we are focusing on a wide range of poetry and nonfiction by African-American writers from slavery to the present day. I will introduce the reader or pairs of readers, after which they will cite the author and title of their selection or selections. Our first reader is our rector, the Reverend Dr. Luke Tiroda. Uh, Luke, you're on. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Thank you again for coordinating this. And you just summarized the um, massive importance of um, this reading um, um, in our community. And thank you very much. Um, Eleanor has invited me to read a portion of um, Martin Luther King's um, I Have a Dream address delivered at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom on August 28, 1963. I said, oh, Martin Luther King can do it much better himself and I could share a video, but um, it's all time sensitive and um, Eleanor, invited my voice to be part of it. So here we go. Um, we all can picture uh, Martin Luther King. He definitely did not have my accent, but he started <laughs> like this. I am happy to join you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check 
when the architects of our Republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were singing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men, as well as white men, would be guaranteed to unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on its promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. We also have come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. And as we walk, we, make, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. I say today then, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, I will be able to hew out the mountain of despair, out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, I pass the word back to you. And I, again, we feel so inspired by the words of Martin Luther King. Thank you. Our next reader is our assistant rector, the Reverend Heidi Thorson. We welcome Heidi back. Hello, and thank you, Eleanor. I will be reading a short poem, Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Barbara Lamb. Can you hear me now? Yes. I am going to be reading a speech. It's actually the transcription of a speech given by Sojourner Truth at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio on May 29th, 1851. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Sojourner Truth was the only black um, speaker at this convention. May I say a few words? I want to say a few words about this matter. I am a woman's rights. I have as much muscle as any man. 
<laughs> and can do as much work as any man. I have plowed and reaped and husked and chapped and mowed. And can any man do more than that? <laughs> I have heard much about the sexes being equal. I can carry as much as any man and can eat as much too, if I can get it. I am as strong as any man that is now. As for intellect, all I can say is, if women have a pint and a man a quart, why can't she have her little pint full? You need not be afraid to give us our rights for fear we will take too much, for we can't take more than our little pint will hold. The poor men seem to be all in confusion and don't know what to do. Why children, if you have women's rights, give it to her and you will feel better. <laughs> you will have your own rights and they won't be so much trouble. I can't read, but I can hear. I have heard the Bible and have learned that Eve caused man to sin. Well, if women upset the world, do give her a chance to set it right, right side up again. The lady has spoken about Jesus, how he never spurned woman from him, and she was right. When Lazarus died, Mary and Martha came to him with faith and love and besought him to raise their brother. And Jesus wept and Lazarus came forth. And how came Jesus into the world? Through God who created him and woman who bore him. <laughs> Man, where is your part? <laughs> but the women are coming up, blessed be to God, and a few of the men are coming up with them. But man is in a tight place. The poor slave is on him, women are coming on him, and he is surely between a hawk and a buzzard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next reader, Murray Harrison. Good morning. I will read uh, two poems this morning. The first is We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our fears and tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but, O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. The second poem is If We Must Die by Claude McKay. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us though dead. Oh, kinsmen, 
we must meet the common foe, though far outnumbered, let us show us brave. And for their thousand blows, deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave, like men, we'll face the murderous cowardly pack pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Robles. You're muted, Daniel. Oh, there we go. An excerpt from Arturo Alfonso Schoenberg, a black Puerto Rican American. Realizing that there was less likelihood of being published, he writes under the more familiar nom de plume, Arthur A. Schoenberg. In his later life, he reclaimed his given name to be totally authentic. He writes, the American Negro must remake his past in order to make his future. Though it, is un, though it is orthodox to think of America as the one country where it is unnecessary to have a past, what a luxury is, what is a luxury for the nation as a whole becomes a prime necess social necessity for the Negro. For him, a group tradition must supply compensation for persecution and pride of race, the antidote for prejudice. History must restore what slavery took away, for it is the social damage of slavery that the present generations must repair and offset. So among the rising democratic million, we find the Negro thinking more collectively, more retrospectively than the rest, and apt out of the very pressure of the present to become the most antiquarian of them all. We need the historian and philosopher to give us with trenchant pen the story of our forefathers and let our soul and body with phosphorescent light brighten the chasm that separate us. We should cling to them just as blood is thicker than water. Thank you. Thank you. Now, our next reader is Tony Basowitz. First, I have to say thank you, Eleanor, for providing me this opportunity to learn about the works of Mr. W.E.B. Du Bois. My name is Tony Basewiz, and I grew up in Connecticut in the 1950s and 60s during a time when African American studies were not offered in my public school curriculum. In my early years, I recall hearing a television news commentator cite the W.E.B. Du Bois clubs in the context of organizations that were a threat to the American way of life. And uh, that's been a, a kind of a question in my background in my mind up to this, this moment, really. I was also led to believe that African-American people were treated horribly in the South, but that we in the North were much better than that. My selected reading is from Mr. W.E.B. Du Bois classic, The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903, just 38 years after the end of the Civil War. Between me and the other world, there is an unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of del delicacy, unasked by others through the difficulty of rightly framing it, all nevertheless flood around it. They approach me in a half hesitant sort of way, eye me curiously or compassionately, and then instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? <laughs> they say, I know an excellent colored man in our town, or I fought in Mechanicsville, or do not these Southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile, or I'm interested or reduce the boiling to a simmer, as the occasion may require. To the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? They answer seldom, answer seldom a word. And yet being a problem is a strange experience, peculiar even for one who has never been anything else, save perhaps in boyhood and in Europe. It is in these early days of a rollicking boyhood that revelation first burst upon one, all in a day as it were. I was a little dark thing, way up in the hills of New England, where the Housatonic winds between the Housic and Taganac to the sea. In a wee wooden schoolhouse, something put it in the boys and girls' heads to buy gorgeous visiting cards, 10 cents a package, in exchange. 
Exchange was married till one girl, a tall newcomer, refused my card. Refused it peremptorily, with a glance. Then it dawned on me that I was different from the others. Or like mayhap in the heart and life and longing, but shut out from their world via vast veil to creep through. I held it all beyond in common contempt and lived it in a region of blue sky and great wandering shadows. That sky was the bluest when I could beat my mates at examination time or beat them at a foot race or even beat their springy heads. Alas, with all the years of fine contempt began to fade for the words I longed for and all their dazzling opportunities were theirs, not mine. But they should not keep these prizes, I said. Some, all, I would wrest from them. Just how I would do it, I could never decide. By reading law, by healing the sick, by telling wonderful tales that swam in my head, some way. As a Negro, sort of a seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself to the revelation of the other world. There's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Tony, thank you. Thank you. Our next reader is Barbara Hedberg. I'm gonna read a poem by Langston Hughes that is called, Let America Be America Again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream, the dreamers dreamed. Let it be the great strong land of love where never kings connive, no tyrants scheme, that any man be crushed by one above. It was never America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, not freedom in this homeland for the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your will across the stars? I am the, I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bear, bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant cl cl clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab of land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need. Oh, work the men, oh, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am this Negro, servant to you all. I am the hungry, humble, hungry mean, hungry yet today, despite the dream, beaten yet today, oh pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yes, I am the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a surf of kings who dreamt a dream so strong so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings. 
in every brick and stone, in every, in every hero turn that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I am the one who left Dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lay. I'm torn from the black Africa strand I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me? Surely not me. The millions on relief today? The millions shot down when we strike? The millions who have nothing for our pay? For all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land whose every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. Some call me, sure, call me any ugly names you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain from those who live like leeches on the people's lives. We must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this truth, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of those great green states and make America again. Barbara, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next reader is Ellen Tillotson. I'm uh, thrilled to be here and really feel really honored to read this poem. You all can hear me okay? Uh, yes. Great. Um, I'm reading a selection called For My People by a poet named Margaret Walker. For my people everywhere, singing their slave songs repeatedly, their dirges and their ditties and their blues and jubilees, praying their prayers nightly to an unknown God, bending their knees humbly to an unseen power. For my people lending their strength to the years, to the gone years and the now years and the maybe years, washing, ironing, cooking, scrubbing, sewing, mending, hoeing, plowing, digging, planting, pruning, patching, dragging along, never gaining, never reaping, never knowing, never understanding. For my playmates in the clay and dust and sand of Alabama backyards, playing baptizing and preaching and doctor and jail and soldier and school and mama and cooking and playhouse and concert and store and hair and Miss Chumby and company. For the cramped, bewildered years, we went to school to learn to know the reasons why and the answers to, and the people who, and the places where, and the days when. In memory of the bitter hours when we discovered we were black and poor and small and different, and nobody cared, and nobody wondered, and nobody understood. For the boys and girls who grew in spite of these things to be man and woman, to laugh and dance and sing and play and drink their wine 
and religion and success to marry their playmates and bear children and then die of consumption and anemia and lynching. For my people thronging 47th Street in Chicago and Lenox Avenue in New York and Rampart Street in New Orleans, lost, disinherited, dispossessed, and happy people filling the cabarets and taverns and other people's pockets and needing bread and shoes and milk and land and money and something, something all our own. For my people walking blindly, spreading joy, losing time being lazy, sleeping when hungry, shouting when burdened, drinking when hopeless, tied and shackled and tangled among ourselves by the unseen creatures who tower over us omnisciently and laugh. For my people blundering and groping and floundering in the dark of churches and schools and clubs and societies, associations and councils and committees and conventions, distressed and disturbed and deceived and devoured by money-hungry, glory-craving leeches, preyed upon by facile force of state and fad and novelty, by false prophet and holy believer. For my people, standing, staring, trying to fashion a better way from confusion, from hypocrisy and misunderstanding, trying to fashion a world that will hold all the people all the faces, all the Adams and Eves and their countless generations. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength of final clenching be the pulsing in our spirits and our blood. Let the martial songs be written, let the dirges disappear. Let a race of men now rise and take control. Beautiful, thank you, Ellen. It was a powerful poem to read. Yes, <laughs> and it won a prize also. Uh. Now we will he be hearing another poem by uh, Margaret Walker, uh, read by Keisha Blake. Good morning. Welcome. We'll be reading Lineage by Margaret Walker. My grandmothers were strong. They followed plows and bent to toil. They moved through fields sowing seed. They touched earth and grain grew. They were full of sturdiness and singing. My grandmothers were strong. My grandmothers are full of memories, smelling of soap and onion and wet clay, with veins rolling roughly over quick hands. They have many clean words to say. My grandmothers were strong. Why am I not as they? Thank you, beautiful, beautiful. Now we are going to nonfiction, uh, Patricia, no, before we go to nonfiction, Lois Reed will be reading uh, two poems by Gwendolyn Brooks. You muted, uh, uh, Kyle. Uh, Lois, Lois, excuse me, you are muted. So we're gonna try and get your, yep. Oh, no, you're muted again. There it is. Well, I have this sticker on my car that says, well-behaved women rarely make history, which may be why I've been given these delightful poems by Gwendolyn Brooks to read, A Little Girl's Voice, A Song in the Front Yard. I've stayed in the front yard all my life. I want to peek at the back, where it's rough and untended and hungry weed grows. A girl gets sick of a rose. I want to go in the backyard now and maybe down the alley to where the charity children play. I want a good time today. They do some wonderful things. They have some wonderful fun. My mother sneers, but I say it's fine. 
how they don't have to go in at a quarter to nine. My mother, she tells me that Johnny May will grow up to be a bad woman, that Georgie will be taken to jail soon or late. On the kind of last winter, he stole our, he sold our back gate. But I say it's fine, honest I do, and I'd like to be a bad woman too, and wear the brave stockings of night black lace and strut down the streets with paint on my face. The other poem is Sadie and Maud. Maud went to college. Sadie stayed home. Sadie scraped life with a fine tooth comb. She didn't leave a tangle in. Her comb found every strand. Sadie was one of the livingest chits in all the land. Sadie bore two babies under her maiden name. Maud and Ma and Papa nearly died of shame. When Sadie said her last so long, her girls struck out from home. Sadie had left as a heritage her fine tooth comb. Maud, who went to college, is a thin brown mouse. She is living all alone in this old house. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, we're now going to two readers of um, different uh, texts by James Baldwin. Patricia Thurston, reading from Nobody Knows My Name. So this was first published in winter 1959 in Partisan Review. And this is just a selection. This war between the Southern cities and states is of the utmost importance, not only for the South, but for the nation. The Southern states are still very largely governed by people whose political lives, in so far at least as they are able to conceive of life or politics, are dependent on the people in the rural regions. It might indeed be more honorable to try to guide these people out of their pain and ignorance instead of locking them within it and battening on it. But it is admittedly a difficult task to try to tell people the truth. And it is clear that most Southern politicians have no intention of attempting it. The attitude of these people can only have the effect of stiffening the already implacable Negro resistance. And this attitude is absolutely certain sooner or later to create great trouble in the cities. When a race riot occurs in Atlanta, it will not spread merely to Birmingham, for example. Birmingham is a doomed city. The trouble will spread to every metropolitan center in the nation which has a significant Negro population. And this is not only because the ties between Northern and Southern Negroes are still very close. It is because the nation, the entire nation has spent a hundred years avoiding the question of the place of the black man in it. And in exactly the same way that the South imagines that it knows the Negro, the North imagines that it has set him free. Both camps are deluded. Human freedom is a complex, difficult, and private thing. If we can liken life for a moment to a furnace, then freedom is the fire which burns away illusion. Any honest examination of the national life proves how far we are from the standard of human freedom with which we began. The recovery of this standard demands of everyone who loves this country a hard look at himself. For the greatest achievements must begin somewhere and they always begin with the person. If we are not capable of this examination, we may yet become one of the most distinguished and monumental failures in the history of nations. Patricia, thank you. Um, our next reader is our deacon, 
uh, Kyle Peterson, again, a reading from Baldwin. Thank uh, you very much, Eleanor. And I have to give a special thanks to Eleanor for helping me prepare an excerpt of this letter, My Dungeon Shook, a letter to my nephew on the 100th anniversary of the emancipation. It was first published in the Progressive Magazine in December of 1962, and then also became the opening to Baldwin's book, The Fire Next Time. The letter itself is not very long, but it's too long to read in its entirety. So I'll put a link in the chat to the whole letter, and I uh, really commend it to your reading. So this is the excerpted version. Dear James, I have begun this letter five times and torn it up five times. I keep seeing your face, which is also the face of your father and my brother. I have known both of you all your lives, have carried your daddy in my arms and on my shoulders, kissed and spanked him and watched him learn to walk. Other people cannot see what I see whenever I look into your father's face. For behind your father's face, as it is today, are all those other faces which were his. Let him laugh, and I see a cellar your father does not remember, and a house he does not remember, and I hear in his present laughter his laughter as a child. Let him curse, and I remember him falling down the cellar steps and howling, and I remember with pain his tears, which my hand or your grandmother's so easily wiped away. But no one's hand can wipe away those tears he sheds invisibly today, which one hears in his laughter and in his speech and in his songs. I know what the world has done to my brother and how narrowly he has survived it. And I know, which is much worse, and this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen, for which neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them. But they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. I am writing this letter to you to try to tell you something about how to handle them for most of them do not yet really know that you exist. I know the conditions under which you were born, for I was there. Here you came, something like 15 years ago, and though your father and mother and grandmother, looking about the streets through which they were carrying you, staring at the walls into which they brought you, had every reason to be heavy-hearted, yet they were not. For here you were, Big James, named for me. You were a big baby. I was not. Here you were to be loved. To be loved, baby hard, at once and forever. To strengthen you against the loveless world. Remember that. I know how black it looks today for you. It looked bad that day too. Yes, we were trembling we have not stopped trembling yet. But if we had not loved each other, none of us would have survived. And now you must survive because we love you and for the sake of your children and your children's children. You were born where you were born and faced the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever. You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. Wherever you have turned, James, in your short time on this earth, you have been told where you could go and what you could do and how you could do it and where you could live and whom you could marry. The details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. Please try to remember that what they believe as well as what they do and cause you to endure does not testify to your inferiority 
but to their inhumanity and fear. There is no reason for you to try to become like white people, and there is no basis whatever for their impertinent assumption that they must accept you. The really terrible thing, old buddy, is that you must accept them. And I mean that very seriously. You must accept them and accept them with love. For these innocent people have no other hope. They have had to believe for many years and for innumerable reasons that black men are inferior to white men. Don't be afraid. These men are your brothers, your lost younger brothers. This is your home, my friend. Do not be driven from it. It will be hard, James, but you come from sturdy peasant stock, men who picked cotton and dammed rivers and built railroads and in the teeth of the most terrifying odds achieved an unassailable and monumental dignity. You come from a long line of great poets, some of the greatest poets since Homer. One of them said, the very time I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. We cannot be free until they are free. God bless you, James. And Godspeed, your uncle, James. Thank you, Kyle, an outstanding reading. Thank you. Now, Warner Marshall will read from a poem that all of you have heard before. But he will not be reading the whole book, uh, Warner. Thank you. Uh, I can't for the life of me get my camera to work, so you're just going to have to listen. It's probably just as better. This is an excerpt from a poem named Horn of Plenty, one of uh, 12 poems in a work named Ask Your Mama by Langston Hughes. Global trotters, baseball batters, Jackie, Willie, Campanella, football players, leather punchers, unforgotten Joes and Sugar Rays, who break away like comets from lesser stars in orbit to move out to St. Albans, where the grass is greener, schools are better for their children, and other kids less meaner than in the quarter of the Negroes, where Winter's name is Hawkins, and Niagara Falls is frozen if the show fares more than 30 cents. I moved out to Long Island even farther than St. Albans, which lately is stone nowhere. I moved out even farther, further, farther on the sound, way off the turnpike, and I'm the only colored. Got there. Yes, I made it. Name in the papers every day. Famous the hard way. From nobody and nothing to where I am. They know me, too, downtown all across the country, Europe, me who used to be nobody, nothing but another shadow in the quarter of the Negroes, now a name, my name, a name. Yet they asked me out on my patio, where did I get my money? I said, from your mama. They wondered, was I sensitive and had I a chip on the shoulder? Did I know Charlie Mingus? And why did Richard Wright live all that while in Paris instead of coming home to decent die in Harlem or the south side of Chicago or the womb of Mississippi? And one should love one's country for one's country is your mama. Living in St. Albans, shadow of the Negroes, Westport and New Canaan in the shadow of the Negroes Highly integrated means too many Negroes, even for the Negroes, especially for the first ones who move in unobtrusive, book of the month in cases, seeking suburb with no jukebox, pool hall or bar on corner, seeking lawns and shade trees and seeking peace and quiet, autumn leaves in autumn, 
Holland bulbs in spring. Decent garbage service. Birds that really sing. $40,000 houses. Payments not belated. The only Negroes in the block integrated. Horn of plenty and escrow to Joe Glasser. The Sermon on the Mount in Billington's Church of Rubber. Love thy neighbor as thyself in George Sikulski's column. Birds that really sing. Every day's tomorrow. Every day's tomorrow and election time is always four years from the other. And my lawnmower, new and shiny from the big glass shopping center, cuts my hair on credit. They rung my bell to ask me, could I recommend a maid? I said, yes, your mama. Thanks. Uh, Warner, Warner um, the Hughes message did come through. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Uh, now, Lucille Bruce will read from Lucille Clifton. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, I'm going to read three poems by Lucille Clifton. And Eleanor pointed out to me that all of, uh, she doesn't use capital letters in her titles or her poems and um, asked me to think about why that might be. So I have two possible answers. One, you could think about these as being in the midst of an ongoing conversation and two, that all, um, all letters are created equal. So the first one is my dream about being white. Hey, music and me, only white. Hair a flutter of fall leaves, circling my perfect line of a nose. No lips, no behind. Hey, white me, and I'm wearing white history. But there's no future in those clothes. So I take them off and wake up dancing. <laughs> this one is called, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. And finally, homage to my hips. These hips are big hips. They need space to move around in. They don't fit into little petty places. These hips are free hips. They don't like to be held back. These hips have never been enslaved. They go where they want to go. They do what they want to do. These hips are mighty hips. These hips are magic hips. I have known them to put a spell on a man and spin him like a top. Thank you. Feel a beautiful reading of Lucille Clifton. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're going to move to Maya Angelou. Uh, Lillian Ravel will read a poem by Angelou. Thank you, Eleanor. The poem is titled, Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken? 
bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard because I laugh like, I'll, like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise. I rise. I rise. Lillian, a beautiful reading by our spiritual leader, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. Now Thank we're you. Going, <laughs> going to continue with Maya Angelou. Uh, Barbara Jari and Ruth Grisberg will read a poem by Maya. Thank you, Eleanor. Ruth and I are very honored to be able to share with you another Maya Angelou poem. And it is entitled, Amazing Peace, A Christmas Poem. Thunder rumbles in the mountain passes and lightning rattles the eaves of our houses. Flood waters await us in our avenues. Snow falls upon snow, falls upon snow to avalanche over unprotected villages. The sky slips low and gray and threatening. We question ourselves, what have we done to so affront nature? We worry God, are you there? Barbara, I'm afraid we've lost your audio. Um, I think to allow you a fair chance, um, Ruth and uh, Barbara, Lights. we're, we're going to try and slide. Oh, Barbara, is your audio back? Can you hear me? Yep, your, your audio is coming in and out. I think what we're going to do is we will slot you in at the end. As we discussed, Barbara will have you call in on your phone so that we can guarantee that your audio will come in clear. Okay, so right. we'll drop you in right before Eleanor's final piece. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sorry about that, Barbara. Yeah, that's you, you'll be back on, and so will you, Ruth. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jeff Freeman and Peggy Myers are alternately reading from the same writer. They will introduce the writer. Okay, the first is a, uh, from chapter two of um, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. It's an excerpt. Cast and race are neither synonymous nor mutually exclusive. They can and do coexist in the same culture and serve to reinforce each other. Race in the United States is the visible agent of the unseen force of caste. Caste is the bones, race the skin. Race is what we can see, the physical traits that have been given arbitrary meaning and become shorthand for who a person is. Caste is a powerful infrastructure that holds each group in its place. Caste is fixed and rigid. 
raced as fluid and superficial, subject to periodic redefinition to meet the needs of the dominant caste in what is now the United States. While the requirements to qualify as white have changed over the centuries, the fact of a dominant caste has remained constant from its inception. Whoever fits the definition of white at whatever point in history was granted the legal rights and privileges of the dominant caste. Perhaps more critically and tragically, at the other end of the ladder, the subordinated caste, too, has been fixed from the beginning as the psychological floor beneath which all other castes cannot fall. Thus, we are all born into a silent war game, centuries old, enlisted in teams not of our own choosing. The side to which we are assigned in the American system of categorizing people is proclaimed by the team uniform that each caste wears, signaling our presumed worth and potential. That any of us manages to create abiding connections across these manufactured divisions is a, as a uh, testament to the beauty of the human spirit. The use of the inherited physical characteristics to differentiate inner abilities and group value may be the cleverest way that a culture has ever devised to manage and maintain a caste system. As a social and human division, writes the political scientist Andrew Hacker of the use of physical traits to form human categories, it surpasses all others, even gender, in intensity and subordination. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson creates several images of caste, C-A-S-T-E, and one of them is a stage play. So I'm going to read that, that image. It was helpful to me to get a, get a better sense of what she's talking about. Day after day, the curtain rises on a stage of epic proportions, one that has been running for centuries. The actors wear the costumes of their predecessors and inhabit the roles assigned to them. The people in these roles are not the characters they play, but they have played the roles long enough to incorporate the roles into their very being, to merge the assignment with their inner selves and how they are seen in the world. The costumes were handed out at birth and can never be removed. The costumes cue everyone in the cast to their roles each character is to play and to each character's place on the stage. Over the run of the show, the cast has grown accustomed to who plays which part. For generations, everyone has known who is center stage in the lead. Everyone knows who the hero is, who the supporting characters are, who is the sidekick good for laughs? And who is in the shadow, the undifferentiated chorus with no lines to speak, no voice to sing, but necessary for the production to work? The roles become sufficiently embedded into the identity of the players that the leading man or woman would not be expected so much as to know the names of or take notice of the people in the back and there would be no need for them to do so. Stay in the roles long enough and everyone begins to believe that the roles are preordained, that each cast member is best suited by talent and temperament for their assigned role, and maybe for only that role, that they belong there and were meant to be there as, as they are currently seen. The cast members become associated with their characters, typecasts, locked into either inflated or disfavored assumptions. They become their characters. As an actor, you are to move the way you are directed to move, speak the way your character is expected to speak. You are not yourself. You are not to be yourself. Stick to the script and to the part you are cast in play and if you and you will be rewarded veer from the script and you will face consequences veer from the script and other cast members will step in to remind you where you went off script do it often enough or at a critical moment 
and you may be fired, demoted, cast out, your character conveniently killed off in the plot. The social pyramid known as a caste system is not identical to the caste in a play, though the similarity in the two words hints a tantalizing intersection. When we are cast into roles, we are not ourselves. We are not supposed to be ourselves. We are performing based on our place in the production, not necessarily on who we are inside. We are all players on a stage that was built long before our ancestors arrived in this land. We are the latest cast in a long running drama that premiered on this soil in the early 17th century. And finally, a reading from the epilogue. We are not responsible for our own ignorance or with time and open-hearted enlightenment, our own wisdom. We are responsible for ourselves and our own deeds or misdeeds in our time and in our space, and will be judged accordingly by succeeding generations. In a world without caste, instead of a false swagger over our own tribe or family or ascribed community, we would look upon all of humanity with wonderment. The life beauty of an Ethiopian runner, the bravery of a Swedish girl determined to save the planet, the physics defying aerobatics of an African-American Olympian, the brilliance of a composer of Puerto Rican descent who can wrap the history of the founding of America at 144 words a minute. All of these feats should fill us with astonishment at what the species is capable of and gratitude to be alive for this. In a world without outcast, being male or female, light or dark, immigrant or native born, would have no bearing on what anyone was perceived as being capable of. In a world of outcast, we would all be invested in the well-being of others in our species, if only for our own survival, and recognize that we are in need of one another more than we have been led to believe. We would join forces with indigenous people around the world, raising the alarm as fires rage and glaciers melt. We would see that when others suffer, the collective human body is set back from the progression of our species. A world without caste would set everyone free. Eleanor, you're muted. Um, Eleanor, you should have just gotten a pop up to unmute. It came to me, Peggy. Oops, you're still muted. Any luck? Yeah. Yep, we can hear you. Yay. <laughs> no. We have um, a married team, uh, John and Gennaro Samuel, who will read uh, together, one before, of course, one after. So, welcome. You are also muted. Okay. I'm new. There we go. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank um, you. We are, re we are reading two excerpts from a sermon preached by the late Reverend Peter Gomes um, at the Harvard Memorial Church uh, for the occasion of Martin Luther King Day. Um, I will start and my wife will finish. Okay. Uh, the title of the sermon is Unfinished Business. The text is from Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. 
The Bible, I will argue, is a work of unfinished business. Think of it. Things get off to a splendid start in the book of Genesis, but then the work of the garden is never finished. The help leaves before it is completed. Moses also gets off to a terrific start, but while he was allowed to see the promised land from afar, which was the object of his life's work, he was not allowed to enter into it, so near and yet so far. The prophets, all of them major and minor, were men of enormous vision, but what fueled them in life was not achievement, but frustration. And our Lord himself can be described not only as the great I am, but as the great incomplete. He came to bring in the kingdom of heaven. There is no other way to read the gospels of Jesus Christ. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That was his agenda. And by the standard of that agenda, he failed. His work was incomplete. He left behind unfinished business and we are still waiting for it to be done. He died before he could complete any of it. Think of that when you think of Christianity as a fixed and finished enterprise. Then there is St. Paul without whom there will be no New Testament at all. St. Paul is always talking about what it is to be while living in the frustration of what is not yet. His correspondence is an endless tape of unfinished business, works in progress, things waiting to be done or things waiting to be undone. Then the whole work of 66 books concludes with St. John the Divine and a vision that simply reminds us of how far we have yet to go before that new heaven and that new earth are accomplished. You can fathom where I'm going with all of this today when we commemorate the life and the service of Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we celebrate officially tomorrow. Like the lives of all martyrs, Martin Luther King's life is a monument to unfinished business, and that is the nature of martyrdom, a life that is offered up and taken away before it has done all that it was meant to do. His life is a monument to unfinished business, but the monument is not to his unfinished business, but rather to ours. His incomplete was completed by death. His unfinished business is that which now remains for us to do. For many people, the remembrance of Martin Luther King is a painful exercise, but not only is there a sense of tragedy to a life taken so violently and prematurely from us, but there is also the remembrance of the savagery of the struggle, the hard won concession for social justice, and now the sense that the moral momentum of that moment for transformation has long passed. We have neither guilt nor hope. Black people can argue that we have won too little that endures, and white people can argue that the debt has been paid and that it's time to get on with, all, with it. In all of this, Martin King re remains a distant, shadowy figure, familiar and yet far removed from the present reality of our world. The time we are given, be it long or short, is time in which to begin and to carry on what others will finish. Life itself is an unfinished business. Only God has a chance to complete what he has begun. In some real sense, it is selfish to pity the fact that Martin Luther King Jr. did not finish all that he had set out to do and that he has left it to us to carry on. It is as if we have the right to expect to inherit the completed fabric of somebody else's labor and how rude and crude of them to go before the job is done and to leave it to us to fill in the blanks. Where though it is written, is it written that we have the right to inherit that which is complete and fully and totally done? Certainly not in Holy Writ as I have just tried to demonstrate and certainly not in the annals of human experience. As you know, if you have any familiarity with all, at all with history, in the movies and on television, everything is tidied up with a neat ending. The wicked are captured and punished, the virtuous are rewarded, and the decks are cleared for the next episode in which the same things are begun, endured, and completed all over again. That is why it is called fantasy. And that is why we view it as entertainment because it is so far removed from rea reality. 
that is not the way of the world. We have toiled all night and taken nothing. That is the way of the world. <clears throat> when King was a graduate student in the Boston University School of Theology, and he said then, and has said since in subsequent of his writings, a person speaks to his time with his life. It is all that he has, all that is given to him, and therefore it is all that he can give. Having said that in his sermon on the new freedom, he cites an anonymous poem. You say, the little efforts that I make will do no good. They never will prevail to tip the hovering scale where justice keeps in balance. I do not think I ever thought they would, but I am prejudiced beyond debate in favor of my right to choose which side shall feel the stubborn ounces of my weight. In the unfinished business of this life, the imperfect work to which we are all called and the work that Dr. King never had fully completed, the question is how we will exercise our right to choose. Which side shall, I, shall feel the stubborn ounces of our weight? We do not live to win. We do not live even to finish. We live to persevere and to endure. Nothing more than this is necessary, but nothing less than this will do until the new heaven and that new earth come. The former things have passed away. The sea is no more and the vision has become the reality. Um, John and Jean Oliver, thank you very much. You know, we started with Dr. Martin Luther King with Luke, so I, this is our return to Dr. King. Now the next speaker also will uh, read something by a writer who was connected with Dr. King. Our next speaker is Will Oxford. Will, welcome to the African American Reading. Thank you, thank you for having me, it's an honor. Um, Today I am honored to read an article by one of my personal heroes, uh, former Congressman John Lewis. You can see his poster behind me. Um, this article was written by him in the days leading up to his death and was instructed to be published on the day of his funeral, um, July 30th of last year. Together You Can Redeem the Soul of Our Nation by John Lewis. While my time here has come to an end, I want you to know that in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you used your power to make a difference in our society. Millions of people motivated simply by human compassion laid down the burdens of division. Around the country and the world, you set aside race, class, age, language, and nationality to demand respect for human dignity. That is why I had to visit Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, though I was admitted to the hospital the following day. I just had to see and feel it for myself that after many years of silent witness, the truth is still marching on. Emmett Till was my George Floyd. He was my Rayshard Brooks, Sandra Bland, and Breonna Taylor. He was 14 when he was killed, and I was only 15 years old at the time. I will never, ever forget the moment when it became so clear that he could easily have been me. In those days, fear constrained us like an imaginary prison, and troubling thoughts of potential police brutality committed for no understandable reason were the bars. Though I was surrounded by two loving parents, plenty of brothers, sisters, and cousins. Their love could not protect me from the unholy oppression waiting just outside that family circle. 
Unchecked, unrestrained violence and government-sanctioned terror had the power to turn a simple stroll to the store for some Skittles or an innocent morning jog down a lonesome country road into a nightmare. If we are to survive as one unified nation, we must discover what so readily takes root in our hearts that could rob Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina of her brightest and best, shoot unwitting concert goers in Las Vegas, and choke to death the hopes and dreams of a gifted violinist like Elijah McLean. Like so many young people today, I was searching for a way out, or some might say a way in. And then I heard the voice of Dar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on an old radio. He was talking about the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence. He said, we are all complicit when we tolerate injustice. He said, it's not enough to say it will get better by and by. He said, each of us has a moral obligation to stand up, speak up, and speak out. When you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. Democracy is not a state. It is an act. And each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process are key. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed you can lose it. You must also study and learn the lessons of history because humanity has been involved in this soul-wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. The truth does not change, and that is why the answers worked out long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our time. Continue to build union between movements stretching across the globe because we must put away our willingness to profit from the exploitation of others. Though I may not get there with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last, and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Well, a wonderful reading. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Charlotte Ray will now read uh, a writer all of us will recognize. <laughs> I'm reading from A Promised Land, Barack Obama's latest book, uh, published really only four or five months ago. Uh, this is an, an excerpt from the, the early part of the book where he talks about his own transition from being a community organizer to well to law school and then running for office. Um, he was a he was a community organizer in Chicago, and he reflects initially on um, the election and um, accomplishments of um, Harold Washington, the first black mayor of Chicago. And yet he goes on. Obama goes on, and what's interesting really are his own reflections and his own. Um, in some ways doubting himself, and yet he goes forward. Um, and yet what a force he was in those days. Despite the roadblocks, Chicago changed on his watch. City services from tree trimming to snow removal to road repair came to be spread more evenly across the wards. But it wasn't so much what he did as how he made you feel that anything was possible. It was shortly after Harold's election that Jesse Jackson decided he would announce 
that he was running for president. Wasn't this where the energy of the civil rights movement had migrated into electoral politics? John Lewis, Andrew Young, Julian Bond, hadn't they run for office deciding this was the arena where they could make the most difference? I knew there were pitfalls, the consequences, the compromises, the constant money chase, the losing track of ideals and the relentless pursuit of winning. But maybe there was another way. Maybe you could generate the same energy, the same sense of purpose, not just within the black community, but across racial lines. Maybe with enough preparation, policy know-how and management skills, you could avoid some of Harold's mistakes. Maybe the principles of organizing could be marshaled, not just to run a campaign, but to govern, to encourage participation and active citizenship among those who'd been left out and to teach them not just to trust their elected leaders, but to trust one another. That's what I told myself, but it wasn't the whole story. I was also struggling with the narrow questions of my own ambition. As much as I'd learned from organizing, I didn't have much to show for the concrete uh, accomplishments. Even my mother, the woman who'd always marched to a different drummer worried about me. I don't know, Barr, she said one Christmas. You can spend a lifetime working outside institutions but you might get more done trying to change those institutions from the inside. And so it was that in the fall of 1988, I took my ambitions to a place where ambition hardly stood out. Valedictorians, student body presidents, Latin scholars, debate champions, the people I found at Harvard Law School were generally impressive young men and women who unlike me had grown up with a justifiable conviction that they were destined to lead lives of consequence. That I ended up doing well was attributed mostly to the fact that I was a few years older than my classmates. Whereas they felt burdened by the workload, for me, days spent in the library felt like an absolute luxury after three years of organizing community meetings and knocking on doors in the cold. There was also this. The study of law, it turned out, wasn't so different from what I'd been doing in my days of musing about civil rights questions. What principles should govern the relationship between the individual and society? And how far did our obligations to others extend? How much should the government regulate the market? How does social change happen? And how can rules ensure that everyone has a voice? I couldn't get enough of this stuff. In classroom discussions, my hand kept shooting up, earning me some well-deserved eye rolls. I couldn't help it. Enthusiasm makes up for a host of deficiencies, I tell my daughters. And at least that was true for me at Harvard. In my second year, I was elected the first black head of the law review, which generated a bit of national press. I signed a contract to write a book. Job offers arrived from around the country. It was heady stuff. The only person though who questioned this smooth path of ascent seemed to be me. It had come too quickly. The big salaries being dangled, the attention, it felt like a trap. Luckily, I had time to consider my next move. And anyway, the most important decision ahead would end up having nothing to do with law. And then in the next chapter, he talks about meeting his partner and his wife, Michelle. Thank you, Charlotte. And to the Samuels, I'll say you notice that we returned to Harvard in this one, making some connections each time from reading to reading. But now we're going to uh, go back to Barbara Jari and with Risberg for the My Angelou. Uh, poem, amazing piece. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So Ruth and I, Ruth Wiesberg, Risberg and I will share with you the beautiful Maya Angelou poem, Amazing Peace, a Christmas poem. Thunder rumbles in the mountain passes, 
and lightning rattles the eaves of our houses. Floodwaters await us in our avenues. Snow falls upon snow, falls upon snow to avalanche over unprotected villages. The sky slips low and gray and threatening. We question ourselves, what have we done to so affront nature? We worry, God, are you there? Are you there, really? Does the covenant you made with us still hold? Into this climate of fear and apprehension, Christmas enters. Streaming lights of joy, ringing bells of hope, and singing carols of forgiveness high up in the bright air. The world is encouraged to come away from the rancor, come the way of friendship. It is the glad season. Thunder ebbs to silence and lightning sleeps quietly in the corner. Flood waters recede into memory. Snow becomes a yielding cushion to aid us as we make our way to higher ground. Hope is born again in the faces of children. It rides on the shoulders of our aged as they walk into their sunsets. Hope spreads around the earth, brightening all things, even hate, which crouches breeding in dark corridors. In our joy, we think we hear a whisper at first, it is too soft, then only half heard. We listen carefully as it gathers strength. We hear a sweetness. The word is peace. It is loud now. It is louder, louder than the explosion of bombs. We tremble at the sound. We are thrilled by its presence. It is what we have hungered for, not just the absence of war, but true peace, a harmony of spirit, a comfort of courtesies, security for our beloveds and their beloveds. We clap hands and welcome the peace of Christmas. We be beckon this good season to wait a while with us. We, Baptist and Buddhist, Methodist and Muslim, say, come, peace. Come and fill us with Fill us and our world with your majesty. We, the Jew and the Jainist, the Catholic and the Confucian, implore you to stay a while with us so we may learn by your shimmering light how to look beyond complexion and see community. It is Christmas time, a halting of hate time. On this platform of peace, we can create a language to translate ourselves to ourselves and to each other. At this holy instant, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ into the great religions of the world. We jubilate the precious advent of trust. We shout with glorious tongues at the coming of hope. All the earth's tribes loosen their voices to celebrate the promise of peace. We angels and mortals, believers and non-believers, look heavenward and speak the word aloud, peace. We look at our world and speak the world aloud, peace. We look at each other, then into ourselves, and we say without shyness or apology or hesitation, peace, my brother. Peace, my sister. Peace, my soul. Thank you, Barbara and Ruth. Um, I want to mention that Barbara introduced us to this poem uh, at Bible study, and we all became attached to it. Thanks to both of you for reading and for returning to read. Um, okay, now I want to thank each of the readers for your preparation and your very meaningful presentations. It was clear that you didn't just come and read, 
that everybody went through a lot of preparation for the reading. I wish to thank um, Kyle and Lillian for their um, very much needed instructions and support through Zoom to make this possible. And of course, to thank the audience for joining in the celebration of Black History Month. I will now close with the reading of the final standard stanzas of a very recent poem, uh, The Hill We Climb, the inaugural poem by Amanda Gorman. We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. But let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left, with every breath from our bruised, pounded breast. We will raise the wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the wind-swept North, East, where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and dutiful, will emerge battered but beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Thank you very much. And we've had another read-in, uh, 18, which of course went extremely well. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Thank you very much for everyone participating. This was indeed an enriching experience. Yes, we had quite a variety of readings and quite a diverse group of readers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very everyone. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. See you Thank next you, Eleanor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.